Good morning, my Real News Media TV family. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning, and I'm wishing for everyone a wonderful and a blessed Sunday. And in the news this morning for November 26, 2023, firearm and ammo seized in St. Anne, one man in custody. The St. Anne police are reporting that one man is in custody following the seizure of one Glock pistol with a magazine containing three 9mm rounds of ammunition. Reports are that about 11.15 p.m. on Saturday, lawmen were conducting an operation in Gulf Steertown in the parish when a search of a Toyota Probox motor car was undertaken. During the search of the vehicle, the weapon was seen in a bag hidden under the driver's seat. The identity of the man who was arrested is being withheld pending further investigations. Former ski mask gang member charged with murder of two boys and a man. A former member of the dreaded Ski Massacre gang was yesterday charged with the triple murder of two boys who attended the Chetwood Memorial Primary and a man from Flower Hill, St. James. Travis Tummings, who was arrested on November 9 by the St. James Police, was positively identified as the shooter in an ID parade earlier yesterday. He was later officially charged with three counts of murder, possession of a prohibited weapon, and using a firearm to commit a felony. Tummings, who has a Flower Hill address, also frequented the Baritone area in St. James, where he was held during a sting operation. 60-year-old taxi operator reported missing 60-year-old Paul Escoffrey, a taxi operator of Henrik Avenue, Kingston 20, has been missing since Friday, November 24. He is of brown complexion, slim build, and about 162 centimeters, or 5 feet 4 inches tall. Reports from the Doheny Park Police are that at about 2 p.m., Escoffrey was last seen at home wearing a burgundy shirt, black sweatpants, and a pair of black shoes. He has not been heard from since. Anyone knowing the whereabouts of Paul Escoffrey is being asked to contact the Doheny Park Police at 876-933-4280, the 119 Police Emergency Number, or the nearest the police station. JLP execs deny paying supporters to show up rebuff corruption accusations. Members of the Jamaica Labour Party have dismissed as absolute foolishness the suggestion that supporters are paid to attend the annual general conferences. That was the response of the party's general secretary, Dr. Harris Chang, when the question was posed by the media during a JLP's editor's forum at the party's Belmont Road headquarters in New Kingston on Thursday. Chang noted that while lunch is usually provided, he insisted that nobody is paid to attend the conference. His party colleague Robert Morgan also contended that it was a nonsensical notion that the people are paid to attend, arguing that we would be bankrupt as a party because we couldn't afford to pay 300 people to come to conference. Morgan said that members of parliament have been getting calls from as far back as July from people overseas seeking details about the exact date for the conference so they can make arrangements to take time off from work in order to attend. Deputy leader of the JLP, Desmond McKenzie, further argued that there was a significant number of supporters who have their own mode of transportation who turn up by themselves, not motivated by anybody to attend. He added that there were about 10 people from his constituency who have traveled from overseas to attend the conference. JLP Chairman Robert Montague, however, pointed out that there is a whole ecosystem around a conference because the event does not end when the Prime Minister walks out of the arena, noting that people look forward to the camaraderie afforded by the event, including after-conference discussions, parties, liming and sharing meals. The whole conference is not just about the speech, it's about the conversations, it's about the socializing, it's about the family coming together, it's about persons who every rural MP has this problem, that you are catering for say 500 persons from your constituency, provide lunch and then 200 more just to turn up, he said. Meanwhile, in response to the perception that political parties are corrupt, Morgan staunchly defended the transparency of the JLP government. If you look at the history, the Jamaica Labour Party has been one of the most transparent and accountable political movements since independence. Many of our accountability institutions that have been created in Jamaica 
have been created under the Jamaica Labour Party, he said. If you think about the Independent Commission of Investigations, when the human rights groups and the citizens are complaining about the state of the police force, we created in the COM, and not just the Indicom, but under the Jamaica Labour Party, you have seen a transformation of the police force. You're not hearing about a state of public emergency and the people's doors are being kicked down. When was the last time you saw a demonstration saying we wanted justice because there was police brutality all across the island? When you think about the Integrity Commission, the Integrity Commission Act is a law that was passed, we fund it. There is no question about the funding. Over a billion dollars annually, $80 billion so far, he said. Morgan further pointed out that based on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, the JLP government over the last six years has a better ranking than any other government since independence. Whenever questions are raised in the country about the actions or omissions of the party and the people in the party, we hold ourselves accountable. I think one of the things we have to recognize is that people expect more from the JLP because people believe in the JLP as being a better government for the country. So because the people have such high expectations of us, sometimes we are pressured to act in a better way, he said. The new generation of political leaders in the JLP am not corrupt. I don't know of my colleagues being corrupt. I see them going to their seats and dedicating their lives. When was the last time you heard a report about a malfeasance in government and a corruption in contracts? That used to be a weekly and a monthly occurrence under the 18 years of the previous government. I can count dozens upon dozens of scandals. The quantum of mismanagement under a previous regime has yet to be fully quantified. We came in and recognized that in order to build Jamaica, the party has to lead from the front and build confidence in the population that you have a party and a leader that you can trust, he said. PNP's single focus highlighted in challenge to retirement age extension. The People's National Party's motive for targeting Director of Public Prosecutions, Paula Llewellyn, in its legal challenge to a constitutional amendment that increased the retirement age of both the DPP and the Auditor General was raised on Wednesday as the matter continued in the Supreme Court. You cannot remove the Auditor General from office unless certain procedures are followed similar to the DPP. The unconstitutionality applies only to the DPP, according to my friends at King's Council Ransford Abraham, said in reference to the lawyers representing the PNP. Braham is one of the attorneys representing the government in the lawsuit filed by PNP Member of Parliament Philip Polwell and Opposition Senator Peter Bunting. The constitutional amendment increased the retirement age of both DPP Llewellyn and Auditor General Pamela Monroe Ellis from 60 to 65. This is the second extension for Llewellyn who would have retired in September at age 63 prior to the adjustment. The first extension was done in 2020 when she turned 60. The PNP, however, has been adamant that Llewellyn should not have received an extension beyond September when the 2020 extension ended and is seeking to have the amendment struck out as unconstitutional and null and void. The PNP feels that the move to extend the DPP's tenure would circumvent, undermine, and or contradict the constitutionally mandated process. On Wednesday, Braham argued that the actual legislation may not be defeated simply by applying the separation of powers principle. If the constitution modifies the separation of powers principle, the court would have no choice but to enforce the legislation. Even if the separation of powers is touched in the general sense, once the constitution permits it, that is the end of the matter, Braham said before giving what he described as an outrageous example. If it is that a parliament should amend the constitution and say that all the children of Braham should be a part of the Supreme Court, regardless of qualifications, that would be contrary to the separation of powers. If the constitution expressly states this, then your leadership would not be empowered to apply a supernova principle of the separation of powers, Braham argued before the panel of judges Sonia Wint, Simone Wolf Rees, and Tricia Hutchinson Shelley presiding over the proceedings. I use that outrageous example to show in the context of this case that once the constitution speaks, that is the end of it. Section 96, subsection 1 of the constitution 
is unentrenched. Section 96, subsection 1b, that gives the executive a role, is capable by itself of amendment without more, that is to say, a simple majority of the members of the House and the Senate. If that procedure were to be followed and the section removed, the role of the Governor General, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, the Constitution permits it, he said. As the judge said in giving a judgment of a South African Constitutional Court, Braham added, if the language used by the lawgiver is ignored in favor of a general resolve to values, then the result is not interpretation, but a divination. In addition to Braham, the government is being represented by Alan Wood, King's counsel Nico Pagan, and Catherine Williams. The attorneys representing the PNP are Michael Hilton, King's counsel Kevin Powell, Duane Allen, and Timira Mason.